Hi, in this video we're going to have a little look at PCB panelization. So first of all we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to panelize your board, then we'll have a little look in the PCB software, how you actually achieve that, and then finally we'll have a look at how to export the file so that you can then go and get it manufactured. There's a whole range of different reasons why you might want to panelize your design. First of all, the most common is that simply if you're going to get your PCB assembled with components onto it, many manufacturers will specify a certain panel size because that is the size of panel that will fit through the pick and place machines using their standard process. So for example, if I just wanted to assemble this one PCB here, there's very little chance that you'd be able to put this into a pick and place machine and pick and place all of the parts because there's no means to hold the PCB in place and the PCB itself is just too small. So 18 by 24 inches is a very common panel size to fit through pick and place machines and what you do is typically fill the entire panel with as many different boards or as many of the same boards as you can. They'd put the stencil over, print the paste onto it and then the pick and place machine would uh, pick and place all of the parts onto all of the boards uh, you know in a much quicker fashion. Another reason that you might want to panelize your PCB is because the PCB itself doesn't meet the minimum guidelines for the PCB size that you can get assembled. So for example here's a little board that I got panelized. These are actually five millimeters and what this is is a little adapter which would allow me to make custom color bicolor LEDs. So it accepts two 0805 LEDs on it, you solder two legs on it and you've got the equivalent of a five millimeter LED with your own colors on it. But these are only five millimeters in diameter and that's below the size of any sort of standard PCB manufacturing process. So I simply wouldn't be able to get these made in any other way other than to panelize them onto a bigger board. The next reason is simply for cost reasons. So for example, if JLC PCB were able to actually supply PCBs that are only five millimeters in size. The offer there is five PCBs for two dollars. So I would have got five of these little boards for two dollars. As it stands, I got five of these little panels for two dollars, which means that you get a whole ton of different boards for that price. Now you can actually um, have as many different designs as you want on your panel. A lot of manufacturers will charge extra for each individual design that's on the board, unless you're physically paying just for a PCB panel service and that typically comes at a premium. So there's some services such as PCB panel in the UK and they might charge something like £150 for a panel of a certain size and then you can do whatever you want on that board. Uh, the lower cost suppliers such as JLC PCB and that will charge you much less um, especially for prototype quantities. So that's one more reason why you might want to panelize your board. The final reason that uh, is commonly used is simply because uh, for example, say you've got a fully packed PCB in a very small footprint, you simply might not have room for things like test points or a means of testing the board afterwards. So what you might do is run some traces out of the PCB and then you'd have your test pads all the way along the panel and it would mean that still when you put it in the bed of nails test or when you're testing it on the bench, you can gain access to all the signals that you need to on the PCB and then when you've finally programmed it or whatever and done all your testing, you can snap it out of the panel and then uh, you've no longer got access to those test points. The PCB that I've got here today is one that I've had assembled at JLC PCB. I did mess up slightly with the footprint for the tactile switches so I will have to hand assemble those and the two terminal blocks are through hole parts so they didn't assemble those but everything else was assembled onto the board using JLC PCB's assembly service and I think the overall board looks pretty good. What it is, is a constant current LED driver. So we can feed in any voltage on the two terminals here from eight to 36 volts, and we can drive an LED currently with the one ohm sense resistor at 280 milliamps. But if we change this, we can drive anywhere up to one amp. And then we've got a microcontroller, which allows us to interface with an IS485 network. So we've got the A and B inputs here, and we can either feed DMX512 so that we can dim the LEDs up and down, or we can feed in our own RS-485 protocol. And we can use the two buttons here to set the address or anything else that we need to, and we've got some status LEDs as well. So here's a closer view of the PCB. We'll have a little look in more detail in a future video where I actually uh, get the firmware on here and give this a test. But uh, we've got 
quite a few components in the JLC PCB library now. So there are tactile switches. Uh, you'll see them on the LED clock, uh, which has just been delivered actually. So we should be able to get back on with the ESP32 NTP based clock very soon. Uh, but they've got a lot more components than they did at the start. So they've got some big electrolytic capacitors now. Uh, they've got some crystals. Uh, they've got more selection of the microcontrollers. And they've got some inductors as well, which was something that was missing. So uh, you can pretty much achieve uh, about 90% coverage of most typical PCBs with the assembly service. So it's looking pretty good now. Let's have a little look at the PCB software and see how we actually go about designing a PCB panel. So here we are in Proteus, which is my preferred PCB tool. And I've laid out the design. This is exactly the finished design. And what you might think you could do is simply copy the PCB as it is now multiple times into the design. But what that actually does is it results in a whole load of DRC errors uh, because these components, the duplicates, wouldn't be in the original design. So the overall layout wouldn't match and nothing would actually work properly. So what you do in most PCB tools is you go to do your Gerber output and typically there'll be a checkbox to enable you to do some kind of Gerber verification at the end. So we'll do that, give it a new file name, and we want to enter panelization mode. So I've clicked that checkbox, pressed OK, and we're now in the panelization editor. So next you want to actually set up the panel, and let's say that our panel is going to be 150 millimeters by 150 millimeters. So we draw a box of that size, and then what we want to do is lay out the PCBs within that panel. And at least in Proteus, what you can do is do a block copy of the Gerber. And you can just duplicate that as many times as you want to get it to fit within the overall panel. The next thing that you need to do is then work out how you're going to separate those PCBs from the panel. Because now this is no longer the board edge. So what you need to do on the mechanical layer of your PCB... That's typically the drilling and routing layer that your PCB manufacturer will use. You need to start creating some cuts and slots. What we've got here is the design that I actually ended up with. I've used one millimeter slots, which is a typical minimum for any slot size for the router cutter that uh, the PCB manufacturer will use. So we've got a slot all the way along here drawn on the mechanical layer, and then we've got two non-plated through holes that are just drilled through to create the rabbit holes which allow you to break off the PCB from the panel because what you actually end up with is all of this bit cut away and then the actual PCB is held in just by this little bit of material here, this bit of material here, here, here and all the way around the board. So you can design that how you want. I think in this instance I actually was a little bit too conservative and I probably could have fitted three drill holes in here to make it a little bit easier to snap the PCB out of the panel. After you're happy with the overall layout you can just export the Gerbers as you would normally. You can export the bill of materials and then you can export the pick and place file. Now in Proteus and many other PCB tools the pick and place file doesn't necessarily get duplicated for the multiple boards. So if, like in Proteus, you only get the pick and place file for the original board that was placed, you then need to edit that pick and place file in Excel. Now this is where it can get a little bit tricky. Basically, what we've got at the top here is the pick and place file for the first PCB, all the way up to this point here. And what I did is I duplicated this four times, which you can see by the different colours just here. And then basically each PCB was vertically spaced by 32.5 millimeters from the next one. So what that means is when you actually come to duplicate the numbers, you want to add 32.5 each time in the Y direction. So for example, C1, we've got four times because we've got four PCBs in the panel. And you can see here in the Y direction, each time we've just added 32.5 millimeters. Now, if you had the PCBs, in a 2x2 two two grid or some other type of grid, you'd also have to uh, increment in the X direction as well. In the bill of materials file, there's no need to do any modifications because C1 is the same on each of the boards on the panel. 
So, you know, for example, C1 is the 2.2 microfarad capacitor. We've got four of those on the board, but this all gets sorted out in terms of multiplying the number of components when you actually upload the files. So here we have the PCB uploaded, and there's nothing special that we need to do to tell it that it's a panel. It's only got one design, so we can just click the one on the different designs here. We can assemble the top side, there's no components on the underside, and then we can add the bill of materials. We can add the pick and place file, and then go through to the next stage. And the software will automatically detect from the pick and place file that there's multiple copies of a certain component. So it knows that there's four copies of U1, for example. So it's actually multiplied the number that we need by four in each instance and placed it in the correct place on the PCB. So there we go. That's just a little look at a panelized PCB and how to actually produce one. If you've got any questions, then obviously leave them in the comments down below if you've got any suggestions. In a future video, we will power this up once I've written the firmware, give it a test and see how it works. So until next time, thanks for watching.